Welcome to um, Science with Susanna. Oh, hang on one second. My phone was wanting to join us and it shouldn't. <laughs> Um, okay, so welcome. I'm Susanna Heinze from Science with Susanna, and I've teamed up with Archer Review to do a series of webinars for you as you prepare for the T7. So this very first one will be on cell structure and function, and I'm very happy to have you all here. So when we think about the T7 and the science that you'll encounter on it, it's broken up into a few different topics. The first topic is anatomy and physiology. You can expect about 18 graded questions on anatomy and physiology on the T's test. There's also chemistry, and you'll have eight graded questions for chemistry. And then scientific reasoning, which is where they ask you to understand graphs and to think about the scientific method, like what is a hypothesis? And there will be nine graded questions on that part. And then biology, which is the topic we're going to focus on today. And then when you think about the biology on the T's, this can be broken down into a few um, topics also. So what we'll focus on today is cell structures, their functions, and organization. And this will really be all we're going to work through today in our hour together. But in future webinars, we'll be covering DNA, chromosomes, genes, RNA, and protein. Additionally, we'll go over basic genetics of inheritance a lot of times this is called Mendelian genetics. Then we'll talk about biological macromolecules. That's like carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, and their basic building blocks. And they've added a portion on the T7 on microbes and disease. So all of these are the biology that you'll be seeing on the T7. And then of course, there's the anatomy and physiology, the chemistry and the scientific reasoning. So our goal at Archer Review is to have a whole series of webinars covering all of these as we move through. And we're starting today with something foundational, which is the parts of the cell and what they do. So the first thing I wanna talk about today, and by the way, there is a handout um, for this webinar. If you look on your control panel on the right-hand side, you'll see something called a handout. And there is a PDF handout of these slides as I'm going through them, you can follow along. Or after the webinar, you could go back and print it out if you'd like to. Also, if you have questions as I go, there is a place over on your control panel that says questions, and you can send a, a question to me, either privately or to everyone. I'll try, you can't hear me? Okay, so, so uh, okay, she can now. All right, good. Um, so yes, the question feature is working. So thank you, Victoria. Um, so you can write questions to me over there privately, or uh, I think there's also an option for everyone to see them. And I will be trying to keep an eye on that as I go. And then what I'll do is when I get to the end of talking about the parts of the cell and going through some practice tease questions, then at that point, I'll make sure that I hit all of the questions if anyone got missed, okay? So I'll be trying to keep an eye on that as I go. All right, so back to the science. So first of all, when you think of the difference between a prokaryote and a eukaryote, there's something really easy to do to always get it right. And that's to realize that a prokaryote is basically bacteria. So I know it sounds like a big fancy word, but everyone's heard of bacteria. Prokaryotes are bacteria. Now there are a couple other groups of prokaryotes, but I'm telling you for all of you going into a healthcare field, you don't even need to worry about that. So just remember that prokaryotes are bacterial cells. And then I'm going to talk to you about the main parts of those. So let's look first at this cell right here. This is 
a bacterial cell. And notice that it has one main circular chromosome. So its DNA, rather than being in strands the way um, they are in animal cells like ours, they form these circles. It's still DNA, but it just loops around. And then they often have these little cute loops of DNA that aren't as big as their main chromosome, and we call those plasmids. And I just want to mention those here because a lot of times when students learn about bacteria that are antibiotic resistance or they have antibiotic resistance, it's because of a plasmid they got. So bacterial cells like to trade these plasmid, plasmids back and forth. And when they get them, they can acquire a new kind of antibiotic resistance just because they traded with other bacterial cells. So first concept, all bacterial cells have DNA and all cells in all organisms will have DNA. And then there are ribosomes and all cells will have ribosomes too. I've drawn them just as these little brown dots, but they actually have like kind of a top and a bottom, like a snowman that only has two pieces. We'll look at that a little more later. Now ribosomes make protein. So these are going to be in charge of making all of the protein for the bacterial cell. All cells will have a cell membrane and that cell membrane is made of lipids and it sort of regulates what can come in and go out of a cell. Now bacterial cells will always have a cell wall. And in fact, one of the ways that we are able to best fight them with antibiotics is by drugs that block them from making a good cell wall. So when you look at um, prokaryotes, think of all these things they have in common. They are going to have DNA, they're going to have a cell wall, they're going to have a cell membrane, and they're going to have ribosomes. All cells will have ribosomes and a cell membrane and DNA, but they don't all have a cell wall. Now, just as important as remembering what bacterial cells or prokaryotes have is recognizing what they lack. So they do not have any organelles. Organelles are things like uh, the mitochondria and the Golgi bodies, and we'll talk about those on our next slide. So those um, organelles, they all have a membrane around them and bacterial cells just don't have anything like that. Also, they won't have a nucleus because a nucleus is basically an organelle. It has a membrane around it. Usually we call that the nuclear envelope. The last thing I want to point out about bacterial cells is they're always single celled. So like plants and animals, those are eukaryotes and they are multicellular, right? And then there are things called protists that are eukaryotes that are single celled, but for the most part, bacteria are the main group that are single celled. So they're always single celled. All right, so now let's move on to the really fun animal cell. So this is the example of a eukaryote that I wanna talk through with you. Uh, plant cells are also eukaryotes, but we're gonna focus on an animal cell in this picture. So what I'm doing here is I'm coloring it kind of this beige color. And this is the cytoplasm. It's a watery fluid that all the other structures are found in. And um, in recent years, I've enjoyed reading about just how special this fluid is. It's actually like a, a, a thick gel. Um, and of course, it's salty. So think of it like a salty jello. <laughs> and that's where all of the substances of the cell are going to be found. Then we'll start with the nucleus and that dark blue line that I drew there, that is that membrane that makes the nucleus considered an organelle. Usually we call it the nuclear envelope. And inside of the nucleus, you're going to have these linear chromosomes. So see how the DNA is in linear strands, whereas in the bacterial cell, I drew it like a circle. And then that nuclear envelope is a lipid membrane that surrounds the, to protect the DNA. And then this yellow dot that I drew here is, um, that is the nucleolus. So off to the left here, I'm gonna keep a running track for you of all of the different organelles as we go through them. The first one is the nucleus and it encloses the DNA. Then there is the nucleolus. 
And the role of the nucleolus is to make the ribosome. So see, I'm writing that over there. The nucleolus makes the ribosomes. That word nucleolus literally means little nucleus. Okay, so then, as I was saying, the chromosomes in a eukaryote, they're in linear strands, and in our human cells, we have 46 of these in our body cells, or 23 pairs is how we say it. So compare that with a bacterial cell with just that one circle. Okay, next to the nucleus, I'm drawing in pink the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, the endoplasmic reticulum, I know it sounds like a big phrase, but really it just means a network of membranes inside of the cell. So we usually call it the ER for short. And the rough ER, which is what I'm gonna show you first, is studded with ribosomes. And that's how that it gets its name. When they would look in um, transmission electron microscopy, really powerful microscopes, they could see that it was like dotted. And it turned out that those dots were ribosomes. So you might remember, I told you on the last slide that ribosomes make protein. So notice that the ribosomes are on the ER right here. And so what can happen is that mRNA from the nucleus can go out of the nucleus and then pass through the ribosome. So I've drawn you one of those little snowmen to show you a close up of a ribosome. And once it goes through the ribosome, then a protein can be made. And I've drawn that in purple. And then that protein, in order to do its function, it will need to be folded properly. So that's where the endoplasmic reticulum comes in. These little mRNA transcripts are able to pass through the ER and get folded properly, and then they can be shipped off to their next um, destination. So over on the left, let's summarize what we just said. You've got the ribosome, which makes proteins. And I've given you three different phrases to remember its job. These things are all equivalent, okay? So the ribosome makes proteins, and we call that process translation. It gets its name because it's translating from the language of DNA and RNA into the language of protein. So it's a translation. And protein synthesis is another way to talk about it. So all those things are equivalent, um, generally speaking. And so if you see a question about what the ribosome does, any of these three things would be correct. Then the rough endoplasmic reticulum, its job is to fold and transport the proteins. So if it has to fold them properly or they won't work right, and then it kind of moves them throughout the cell toward their next destination. Then it blebs off these little vesicles, and then those vesicles will go to the Golgi bodies, which I'm drawing here in green. Now, these have a few different names. Sometimes you'll hear it called the Golgi complex, sometimes you'll hear it called the Golgi apparatus, and sometimes you'll hear it called the Golgi bodies. So complex apparatus bodies. I have preferred Golgi complex in more recent times, but I see, still see it said all the different ways. Okay, so this protein now that's blebbed off from the ER, it's now been folded, but it might still need to be modified. So what the Golgi does, and it's like little stacks of pancakes, right? It passes the protein through the layers, and as it does so, it modifies them by adding sugars or lipids. So if you've ever heard of a glycoprotein or a lipoprotein, it's thanks to the Golgi complex adding these that you're able to get to this modified protein that does its final job as a glycoprotein or a lipoprotein. And then I've drawn it here being secreted from the cell. Then over on the left, we can summarize what this does. So the Golgi complex modifies proteins with sugars or lipids. All right, next I've drawn what kind of looks like a red garbage can. That is the lysosome. So this membrane bound organelle is really important in breaking down old cell parts. So I've written here that it contains enzymes that can break down biomolecules. 
these enzymes are really powerful. So they can break down DNA. They can break down carbohydrates and proteins and lipids. So if they got loose out of the lysosome, they could potentially destroy the whole cell. So they're contained within this membrane inside of the lysosome where those enzymes are not yet able to damage anything in the cell. But then the cell can put things in there that they want to have broken down. Okay, most of you will recognize this next organelle. It's probably the most famous, maybe besides the nucleus, and that is the mitochondria, the mighty mitochondria, it's usually called. So the mitochondria is often nicknamed the powerhouse of the cell because it makes ATP. So it's able to convert the energy from the foods you eat, those carbon chains, whether they're in a carbohydrate or a lipid or even a protein, break those down and produce ATP for the cell. So down on the bottom left, running out of room down there, the mitochondria produces ATP through a process called oxidative phosphorylation. So that means it requires oxygen. And this process then will generate ATP. And that is a topic um, that's part of cellular respiration. And we'll talk about that one in a future webinar as you're reviewing for that part of the tease. Okay, then I want to mention the cytoskeleton or the cytoskeletal elements. These are things like actin and myosin. So most students have heard of actin and myosin in the context of um, muscle contraction, and that surely is an important role. So myosin is a molecular motor that can move on actin and shorten up a muscle for contraction. But notice here that I've drawn these actin fibers and they can actually change the shape of the cell. And that, in my opinion, is one of the coolest things that they do. So anytime you think of a cell that has a projection on it, whether it's a neuron with like an axon terminal or a dendrite or an intestinal cell with those little wrinkly microvilli on top, those are held in, in place by these protein filaments called actin. Then there can also be thicker um, cytoskeletal, cytoskeletal elements. And the best example there is probably microtubules. And they have a molecular motor that moves on them called kinesin. And there's even another one called dynein. But these microtubules, their probably most famous role is in mitosis. They form the spindle fiber that helps to divide a cell to pull the, to pull the chromosomes apart. And that will also be something we talk about in a future webinar. We'll go over mitosis for part of your review. So the cytoskeleton gives the cell its shape. It's important in muscle contraction. And it's also very important in cell division, forming that spindle fiber. So these motors move on the filaments. They're like little machines and they can move things all around a cell like roads. But imagine if you wanted to go in a certain direction and you could just make a road go that way and then disassemble it and then make the road go another way. So these are very dynamic. They can change where the roads go in the cell at any given time. Okay, now this cute little pink organelle, this is also endoplasmic retic reticulum like we talked about before, but this is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And that means that it doesn't have any ribosomes on it. So this is the smooth ER or the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And it has the very important role of making lipids for the cell. So it makes all of these membranes that we've been talking about. So it's gonna make all the membranes. It makes uh, steroid hormones because those are lipid based. And also a lot of chemical signaling in your cells is actually based on like little lipid molecules. Uh, maybe you've heard of prostaglandins and those are things that can make someone feel more pain if they have an injury, for example. And a lot of those are based on um, cell signaling chemicals that come from this ER. 
Okay, so then up in the top right corner, I just want to summarize a little bit about eukaryotes because we're contrasting eukaryotes with prokaryotes. So eukaryotes have organelles and so they have all these structures that are membrane bound. And if that's the case, then that means they can have a nucleus because a nucleus has a nuclear envelope. Okay, so that was a lot of information and now we're gonna practice. So I've written some practice T7 questions for you that cover this content. Let's go ahead and take a look at the first one. Okay, your first question. These small structures synthesize protein and are found in all cells. So option one is endoplasmic reticulum. B is Golgi complex. C, ribosomes. D, lysosomes. Got your answer? So the correct answer is ribosomes. Now we'll go ahead and look at this um, slide here to kind of help make sure you understand why. So ribosomes are found in all cells because they are not an organelle like those other options. So the Golgi complex, or here they call it Golgi apparatus, that was one of the options, but these are all membrane bound. So they are not going to be found in all cells. They're only going to be found in eukaryotes. So when the question was saying they're found in all cells, well, organelles aren't. So that immediately is going to rule out the Golgi apparatus, which was one of your options, the lysosome, and the endoplasmic reticulum was another option on there. So all of those are ruled out because they're membrane bound and they're only found in eukaryotes. So here I highlighted, you've got um, you know, these membranes on the, the different organelles and some organelles even have double membranes. So the mitochondria has a double membrane and chloroplasts do too. You might be thinking, I didn't put a chloroplast yet. I haven't talked about that. And that's because those are only found in photosynthetic eukaryotes. Photosynthetic meaning that they can make their own food. So a chloroplast allows a cell to be able to make its own sugar. So we do not have chloroplasts. We are not photosynthetic. We're heterotrophs. We have to eat other things. And then I want to show you what's so cool about the nucleus is its envelope or membrane has pores in it, and that will allow mRNA transcripts to exit through these little holes and then go out into the cytoplasm where they'll go through a ribosome and be translated into a protein. Okay, so then off to the left and down on the bottom of this slide, I've drawn you a close up of a ribosome. In comparison to the organelles, ribosomes are teeny, 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 tiny, uh, but I drew it big for you here. So ribosomes are not membrane bound. They are found in all cells. They're in prokaryotes, they're in eukaryotes. It's a key takeaway. So organelles are only found in eukaryotes. And the eukaryotes include animals, plants, fungus, that's things like mushroom and yeast, and protists. Most students don't remember too much about protists, but you might remember uh, looking at euglena in a microscope in a general biology class, and it kind of swims around. So it's a, a single-celled uh, eukaryote that has chloroplasts inside of it. All right, let's go on to another question. This membrane bound organelle folds and transports proteins. It is often covered with ribosomes. So is it the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi bodies, or the mitochondria? So I'll let you take a look at that. Think about what you want your answer to be, if you're confident. So the correct answer is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So I've drawn it a little bit for you right here. 
And remember, it's usually right next to the nucleus and it's usually studded with ribosomes. And so then the mRNA can go through um, the ribosome, enter the ER and get folded properly. So it is membrane bound and it folds and transports proteins and is often covered with ribosomes. It's not the smooth ER. You can rule that out on this question because the smooth ER lacks ribosomes. It does not have them. The smooth ER has a different job. It doesn't fold and transport protein. It makes lipids. Remember, it makes the membranes, it makes steroids. The Golgi bodies, it has a different job too. Its job is to modify the proteins so it will make um, glycoproteins and lipoproteins with its additives and then the protein is all ready to do, go do whatever its job is supposed to be. And it's not the mitochondria. Probably you remember that one, that that one makes ATP. It's not about folding and transporting proteins. Okay, now this next question is um, a new kind that is on the T7. There will be some fill in the blanks on the T7. So the blank is an organelle that is filled with enzymes and is responsible for breaking down and recycling old cell parts and other debris. So think about, so it, it's an organelle, so it needs to be membrane bound, it means it's only gonna be in a eukaryote. I wonder, if you got that one, and if you can spell it, right? So the correct answer on this one is lysosome. The lysosome is an organelle that is filled with enzymes and is responsible for breaking down and recycling old cell parts and other debris. So again, notice that the lysosome is an organelle and that's only going to be found in eukaryotes. Bacteria does not have lysosomes. All right, next question. Which of the following structures is membrane bound? Select all that apply. So this select all that apply, this is also new on the T7. Okay. Hmm. Looks like my connection went bad. Um, Okay, so then in the, um, so when you see this select all that apply, what I want you to do is to think about, I'm trying to reconnect my, um, let's see, I think my internet might have. Hang on one second. Let's see. Well, it looks like my internet may be down. Let's see what happens if I try to click through any of this. Um, might, might just be have to go through my handout with you, which we could do. Let's see if I can show this to you. Oh yeah, you can see this, that's good. Okay, so if I make this, oops, sorry. All right, we are back in business with this. Let's see. Sorry if you're getting, is that making you dizzy? Okay. All right, here's where we're at. 
Okay, so what I was going to say about, um, let me just back up here real quick to tell you. So whenever you see a select all that apply, I want you to think about that as like a, each, you have to look at each question and think, is, is this true or not? Oh, and what I was going to say right before my internet crashed um, on my iPad is, that um, on the NCLEX, this is like very common that you're going to see this. So you could have all of them be true. You could have one be true. You could have two or three or four of them be true. So you have to really be ready to tackle any of those. Okay, so when you think about these, which of the following is membrane bound, then it could be the nucleus, is that true? The rough ER, is that true? The lysosome, the ribosome, or the tRNA? So think about that. Do you think nucleus? Yes. Rough ER? Yes. Lysosome? Yes. Ribosome? No, it is not membrane bound. And tRNA is a kind of nucleic acid. It's not either. So if we go down to our answer, you're going to see it all at once, but the nucleus, um, it has these membrane pores that allow mRNA transcripts to exit. It has a nuclear envelope that breaks down for mitosis. The rough ER, it has a membrane and it is able to fold and transport all of these proteins inside of it. The lysosome is membrane bound. Remember when we talked about this one, it has powerful enzymes stored inside its membranes. And if those were to break out, then it could damage the whole cell. So those three are all true. And on the T7, you would have to uh, choose all three of those in order to get the question right. Now, ribosome is not membrane bound. It's made of protein and RNA and tRNA is also um, not membrane bound because that's just RNA. Okay, now this next question, this is also um, a new kind of question that you could see on the T7. It's where you have to put something in the proper order. So within a cell, put in order the most typical flow of production of a protein that will be secreted from a cell. So you have to, you would have to put these in order. And if you're taking the test on a computer, you can move the options around. So for this though, we're just gonna go through them and figure out what order they should be in. So protein is modified with a sugar by the Golgi body. Well, we don't know if that's the first or the last thing because we need to read the other options, right? The protein is folded by the rough ER. Hmm, that happens before, right? It goes to the rough ER before it goes to the Golgi. So we know B is before A. Protein synthesized by a ribosome. Well, that's even earlier, right? I'm moving that one to first place right now, but let's keep going and see. D, mRNA produced in the nucleus. That is even sooner. So now that one gets the first place option. And then protein transported in a vesicle to the plasma membrane. That sounds like the very last thing that would happen. So the trick is on these kind of questions is to make sure you do check your answer before you submit it too. So um, down here, I'll show you these one at a time. So what we, realized is that D is first. The mRNA is produced in the nucleus and we call that process transcription. Then the second thing that happens is that the protein is synthesized by a ribosome. We call that translation. Then once you get the protein, it needs to be folded and that happens inside the rough ER. Then after it gets folded, it needs to be modified by the Golgi complex with sugars or lipids. Now we have a protein that's ready to go do its final job. And then that protein can be transported in a vesicle to the plasma membrane and then sent out. We call that a secretory vesicle. So then on this slide, 
you can see that um, the nucleus, so, so let's see, if we start at the very beginning here, um, see where it says nucleus transcription of mRNA, then that mRNA goes out into the cytoplasm, it goes through a ribosome, and that's where the protein is synthesized. And then the proteins move through the rough ER, and they get folded as they move through the channels of the ER. Once it's folded, then it gets blebbed off from the ER, and it's carried in a transport vesicle to the Golgi complex, where that modification can happen, either lipids or sugars. And then finally, it can get passed from a secretory vesicle out to be secreted from the cell. So that's what we call protein processing. And I personally think that whenever you're thinking about what do the parts of the cell do, to try to keep it like a story like that. Think about what has to happen in order to get from the nucleus till you can actually secrete a product from the cell. And then you can walk your way through these processes of transcription, translation, folding, modification, and then secretion. Okay, here comes another select all that apply. So on this one, um, again, when you see select all that apply, I want you to think, I have to think if each one of these statements is true or false. So treat each one as a true or false statement. So which is true of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum? Select all that apply. Is it a membrane bound organelle? Is it found in bacteria? Is it covered with ribosomes? Is its primary purpose to fold and transport proteins? So I wonder if you're noticing that you were comfortably able to say that A is true. It is a membrane bound organelle. I've sort of been hammering that into our heads, right? Going over and over that. So yeah, it's membrane bound, but that means it's not in bacteria. So B doesn't work and it's smooth. So it's not covered with ribosomes and hey, it's the rough ER that folds and transports them, right? Not the smooth ER. So I gave you a super tricky one here. I gave you a select all that apply that only has one option that turned out to be true and that can mess with you when you're taking a standardized test, but just trust your instincts. If you've looked at each one and you're confident that it's true or false, don't let things like that throw you off because that can happen. So then here, going through these. Um, so remember, select all that apply, treat each statement as a true or false. The smooth ER makes lipids, so that is going to be true. B doesn't work, there aren't any organelles in prokaryotes and bacteria are prokaryotes. It's not covered with ribosomes. The rough ER is covered with ribosomes, not the smooth ER. And the primary purpose of the rough ER is to fold and transport proteins, but the smooth ER makes lipids. So on this one, there was only one correct answer, even though it did say select all that apply. Can't get trickier than that. Okay, our next question is about the nucleolus. Which is true of the nucleolus? A, it is located just outside the nucleus. B, it produces ribosomes. C, it contains all of the cell's DNA. Or D, all of the above. So when I go through these, I think, Nucleolus, that's the little nucleus. It's inside the nucleus. So it's not just outside the nucleus. It is inside the nucleus. So that one's not going to work. It produces ribosomes. That sounds right to me. I'm going to have in my mind, I'm probably going to pick that one. It contains all of the cell's DNA. No, that's the nucleus that contains all of the cell's DNA. The nucleolus happens to be in the nucleus, but it doesn't have the DNA inside of it. So D doesn't work. It's not all of the above because we ruled everything out, out except for B. So B would be the correct answer here.
So this kind of goes through that. It's actually located inside the nucleus. It does produce ribosomes. It is the nucleus, not the nucleolus, that contains the cell's DNA. So it's not all of the above. Okay, next question. Which is true of the cytoskeleton? Select all that apply. <laughs> I'm really running you through your paces on these. So does the cytoskeleton have thin or thick filaments? Are actin and myosin cytoskeleton elements? Are there molecular motors such as myosin and kinesin that attach and move along cytoskeletal elements such as actin and micro microtubules? And with the cytoskeleton, is its only role in muscle contraction? So you need to go through these and think each statement, is it true or false? So yes, it may have thin or thick filaments. Actin is the thin filament, myosin is a thick filament, so actually, if that's true, which you know, then that means B also works, right? Actin and myosin are cytoskeletal elements. And then for C, molecular motors such as myosin and kinesin, those are the motors that move along the roads of the cytoskeleton. And it's not its only role in muscle contraction. Remember the cytoskeleton gives shape, so it gives like wrinkles on the top of a cell or makes the axons and a neuron, so you have these different shapes of cells. And the other thing the cytoskeleton is really important for, it forms the spindle fiber during cell division in order to separate the chromosomes. So then I think on this slide, kind of walk you through that again. So remember to treat each statement as true or false when it select all that apply. Those first three statements are true. The last one is not because it has multiple roles, the cytoskeleton does. Okay, so that um, wraps up our practice for today. And uh, we will be having future webinars and hopefully I'll get better at the technology. <laughs> um, and let me go over here and see if there were um, any more. Okay, lots of, let's see, Roxana. Yes, so Roxana asked, so on the T's, can there be select all questions that only have one answer? I think theoretically, Roxana, it can happen, but it would be tricky. So I would hope it wouldn't happen to you. But if you go through them and only one is correct, then theoretically that could be, be the way it, it would work out. Um, I haven't come across too many practice questions like that, but I just want you to be aware of how to approach that kind and to realize that it could be one, two, or three of them for all that apply. I know, and if they do do that, it would be tricky. And, oh, thanks, Kelly. I'm glad it's helpful. And so Lisa is asking about misspellings on the fill in the blank. I, we're still looking into this because the T7 is kind of new for, for us, but we are thinking that the spelling does matter. And I'm actually going to be taking the T7 and I'll find out more about that. But for now, on a fill in the blank, I want you to assume that you have to spell it properly. So make sure that you know how to spell, for example, all of the parts of the cell. Can you spell the word mitochondria? Can you spell the word lysosome, like the one that we did on this? Um, the fill in the blank is actually the part where they're adding to the T7 that I think, um, we still have the most questions about wanting to know um, how they're how they're going to do those ones and so um, i'll probably at our next webinar i'll know because i'll have already taken the t7 let's see oh so rachel is saying she already took it and there were no fill in the blanks yes the fill in the blanks were only in the math section that would be amazing if that were true because that takes out the spelling problem right because you're just putting a number in so I certainly hope that that is the case. Okay, and then uh, Gemma asked about microbiology. Um, yes, there will be, they're calling it microbes and disease. 
and it wouldn't be like everything you learn in a microbiology course, but there could be a little bit of that and certainly um, needing, no, needing to understand about like the immune system, that is definitely going to be something they're gonna be asking about and how our immune system fights off microbes. Okay, so, um, and when will the next webinar be? Um, I would like to do one in about two weeks. So I will, um, we'll send, if you were here today, you'll get an email and we'll make sure to let you know when the next one is. And let's see. Yeah, so another question about that. Um, all right. So I think I got through. Um, thanks, you guys, for um, your kind words, because I know it was a little bit clunky. <laughs> I'll hopefully get better at that. And um, I'm not sure, maybe one of my kids blew out my iPad internet because it completely crashed on me. But next time, it will hopefully go better. So um, I think we're about done. And let me see if we have a poll. I think when you're done, you'll get an email and they'll have a poll question for you. And I believe what it will be is asking about how you heard about this one, um, because I did a little YouTube video, but I'm not sure if that's where very many people found the webinar from. And then I know Brandon Kraft has an amazing Facebook math page and that that um, brought a lot of people attention to this. And I think he's also going to be doing webinars and we have um, uh, Josie Slepian is now going to be working with us for the reading and English, the language usage part, and um, she's amazing too. And so we might also be able to do a group webinar where we can talk about general strategies for the T's and have all three of us there. Um, and that's about it. So let's see a few more questions. Um, am I going to upload on YouTube? So I think if you mean this webinar, um, I think it's recorded and so you can watch this after it's over whenever you want and rewatch it and um, are you going to share the charts with us yes so that you can there's a handout here um, on on your control panel and you can print this um, slideshow out and then uh, you can rewatch the webinar uh, too. Let's see. I think about how to watch the webinar again. It will probably be included in the email that you get after this uh, presentation. And yes, the, um, the handout is printable. It has color on it. So if you don't mind printing it in color, you know, I like to use a lot of color. If you print it in black and white, you could probably color it in yourself a little bit. And uh, yeah, Yan, are you able to find the slides over there? It says handouts um, and then it says T7 Science Archer Review. Okay, yeah, and someone's saying from the Brandon Craft Facebook um, page, I've heard that he, um, has uh, a, just an amazing following over there on his Facebook page. So anyone that's looking for math help, um, he is also working with Archer Review to be make, he's making practice questions and he'll be doing webinars as well. All right. Someone said, yeah, he is the best in math and he has that great Southern accent. Okay, um, so I'm going to close out the webinar for now. Um, you know, you can also email me at um, SusannaHeinze at gmail.com um, and also through my website, Science with Susanna. You can always email me there too if you have questions or follow-up things. So thanks very much, everybody. I hope you have a great um, rest of your day and Hopefully we'll have another webinar in about two weeks and we'll let you know what specifically the topic will be and we'll have a handout just like this too. Okay, take care.